In Argentina, the election of 1916 chose Hipólito Irigoyen, who led the middle class reform party with working class support, the radical, radical civic union, La Unión Cívica Radical. It distributed pensions and public employment to its supporters, but the role of the foreign capital in Buenos Aires did not disappear. He created a government agency to supervise oil production. Uh, in Peru, we have Victor Raúl Aya de la Torre, who led the Peruvian nationalists mostly from exile. He was exiled in 1920 for student protests against Peru's pro-U.S. dictator. He founded an international party, the Popular American Revolutionary Alliance, which is the APRA, against imperialism and foreign investment in Latin America. He preferred the term Indo-America for the indigenous roots, indigenismo. Uh, Peru remained more ethnically split, the highlands heavily indigenous, and the coast more black and white. So we have La Sierra, the highlands, which are more indigenous, y La Costa, which is more black and white. And there's still that rivalry between the coast and the highlands, La Sierra y La Costa. APRA did not go far, but the movement had an impact on Peru. It terrified the conservatives. In 1932, APRA revolted after losing a managed election and the army crushed the uprising with mass executions and APRA was banned from Peruvian politics. Colombia, Chile, and Cuba, you will see that the nationalists did not take over everywhere but show political power. In Colombia, rural oligarchies held their ground. We have Jorge Eliezer Gaitan, who denounced a massacre of banana workers who worked for a U.S. multinational corporation. And two decades later, it will explode in violence. In Chile, during the 13-day Socialist Republic with the leader known as Marmaduke Grove, that was his real name, the nationalists of the right fought successfully against those on the left and no single government consolidated power, they say. In Cuba, they overthrew an unpopular neo-colonial style dictator in 1933, and this was carried by a, na by a national coalition led by Sergeant Fulgencio Batista. He was poor and came from a very humble background of cane cutter, and he was a mulatto, but he really wanted power, and they said that he complied with the U.S. with everything. And they say he was a puppet of the U.S. for many decades. The IC and the uh, activist governments of the 1930s, the Great Depression of the 1930s finished neocolonialism. So the U.S. couldn't focus on you know, colonizing the uh, Latin America anymore and energized national movements in Latin America. The 1929 crash of the New York stock market made the volume of Latin American international trade contract by half. The effect of the collapse of international trade was import substitution industrialization. So you're stopping the import from the foreign, foreign countries and you're substituting with industrialization that is done nationally. So the EC or IC, I don't know, it's the import substitution industrialization. The import is being substituted by national industrialization, producing of their own. It's a trade and economic policy which advocates replacing foreign imports with domestic production, as you can see. Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, and Rio de Janeiro, and Mexico City, the big mega cities, were already becoming the industrial centers. So Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina were the main beneficiaries. Chile and Uruguay as well. The high living standards is what provided more prospective consumers per capita. So whatever they were producing, people are able to buy in mega cities like Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. But the rest of the Latin American countries did not benefit from this because they don't, people don't have enough capital to buy, to consume whatever is being produced and make the factories bigger. So the small countries with more poor rural populations could not consume, like Ecuador, Bolivia, Nicaragua, and Honduras, Paraguay, and Dominican Republic. Uh, light industry will work in these particular countries, like soap, matches, beer, biscuits, shoes, aspirin, and cheap cloth. 
uh, responded most to the market. As for the mega city production, will be bigger industries like car industry, something like that. Uh, heavy industry like cars, radio, and refrigerators responded less, and heavy industries require steel. And only like mega cities like Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and Chile, like you can see, like Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Buenos Aires, and Santiago did that in the 1940s. So in Brazil, what happens in Brazil? Within two decades, 20 years, industry will surpass, surpass our agriculture. So the industry will grow massively, replacing agriculture. Leader, President Hertulio Vargas, he was a president a total of 19 years. And um, rebellious young army officers known as tenentes, lieutenants, stage uprisings against oligarchies in Brazil. They, they formed a thousand men army column that marched for two years through Brazil. Can you imagine that? To get support for the revolutionary nationalist vision that you would have Hertulio Vargas lead. Uh, so can you imagine doing that uh, thousand men armed column marching? This is a picture of that. Coffee economy had a crisis to crisis until there was an overproduction. So the coffee prices will go down, drop less than a third of its low price in the world market when the depression came. And in the 1930s, Vargas wins the election against another candidate who represented the pro-coffee interest. The coffee economy is going down, so Hertulio Vargas wins. The revolutionaries had liberals opposed to King Coffee and young tenentes, strong nationalists who despise liberals. Uh, famous tenentes joined the Communist Party, making it the heart of the alliance for national liberal liberation. It will be ALN, which is the radical left. And far right group, integralists, inspired by fascism. So you have the radical left with Alliance for National Liberation and you have the integralists who are the far right uh, with the inspired by fascism. In 1937, Vargas assumed dictatorial power with the support of the army and announced on the radio a nationalist institutional makeover for Brazil. It will be called the Estado Novo or the new state. Estado Novo was highly authoritarian government, very centralized with Hertulio Vargas. All legislative bodies were dissolved, so there's no legislature, and um, political parties were banned. The mass media was censored, very controlled. Uh, he sent a centrally appointed interventors to direct state government, very controlled. The police of the Estado Novo operated with brutality. So there was a lot of violence from the police force. And the national councils and commissions were created to supervise railroads, mining, immigration, schools, school textbooks, sports and recreation, hydraulic and electrical energy, and so on. So Estado Novo, did a lot of changes actually for Brazil. It brought a lot of progress in some way. Estado Novo founded the National Steel Company, a steel mill, and the National Motor Factor turned out engines for trucks and airplanes uh, and prohibited foreign ownerships of newspapers. So everything is nationalized and they're creating industries, okay? And I remember many of these cars came to other countries. Like when I was living in Bolivia, uh, most of the cars that were driven in the 80s were from Brazil. So in Brazil, the mixing of race is celebrated. Immigrants were told to speak Portuguese and try to integrate themselves into the national society. And they really celebrated the national uh, race mixing to embrace their African heritage that was being mixed with the Portuguese. And in 1933, the positive qualities of racial and cultural fusion had been promoted. 
in The Masters and the Slaves, for example, by Gilberto Freire, uh, argued that Brazil's African heritage had created Brazil's distinctive national identity. So you will see the African um, uh, mixing with the European and creating something completely new that was considered Brazilian, the fusion of those cultures. A field of Afro-Brazilian studies suddenly rose and uh, Afro-Brazilian Samba became the country's cultural uh, signature. And Carmen Miranda, a famous singer, dancer, and actress, became very famous at this time. She's the one who wore fruit on her head, like in a fruit basket, became very popular in movie, movie showing the musical, uh, national music heritage of Brazil through her. And she was really good in Portuguese. Later on, she went into Hollywood and tried to do it in English, and it didn't sound the same. And she actually lost her popularity when she started doing movies in English because it did not translate the culture that you have with the fruit basket and all that, uh, very specific to the Brazilian culture, I think. And the writer Oswald de Andrade wrote something called To Be or Not To Be. It's like the Shakespearean thing that is to be or not to be. But I remember Tupi was the uh, indigenous group that was found in uh, Brazil when they came to America. And he put to be or not to be, that it, to be, that is the question in this influential uh, writing that he called Cannibalist Manifesto of 1928. And Andrade in this suggested that Brazilian artists, metaphorically, right, had to eat the European art, cannibalize it, consume it, digest it, and create something completely new with the African influences and the native in influences that would be completely and uniquely Brazilian which is very interesting, right? The idea of cannibalizing all that art, mixing it with the cultures of African and indigenous or native, whatever is from Brazil, and creating a completely new fusion that is uniquely Brazilian. So uh, there are some paintings that you will see uh, that does that. And I was able to see the painting in Buenos Aires, you know, but Tarsila do Amaral, and kind of representing, I guess, um, you know, I don't know, it's like expressionism and different things and cannibalizing the ideas and spitting out to be something new, okay? And we have something like that in this painting. The Estado Novo made industrialization a priority with extensive labor uh, legislation and the social legislation was from health and safety standards to minimum wage, 48-hour work week, retirement pensions, um, and maternity benefits, and was put in place for industrial working class and urban middle class people in Brazil. The Brazil's nationals movement was urban-based and urban-oriented, so it benefited the urban people but not really benefited the agricultural side. Only in Mexico, where the peasants helped the revolution, did nationalism transform rural societies too. 